Healthcare has been one of the great unsolved problems in the world. We've been talking about issues in healthcare for 30 or 40 or 50 years. Costs are out of control. In the U.S., we're spending an unsustainable amount of money for healthcare. Irrespective of where in the world you are, an asthma patient is an asthma patient. And a prostate cancer patient is a prostate cancer patient. And it has to be the goal of everybody involved in the system to optimize the quality of care and the results for that patient group. You know, when you ask what's broken in healthcare, I think there are equity issues, there are access issues and delivery issues. We will run out of money just like anybody else. Business as usual is never going to be okay again. The actual use of the word quality has created more problems than solutions in healthcare. If you don't measure things, you can't improve them, you can't manage them. If you would go a step further, and if you would have internationally outcome analysis, that would uh, change the health system tremendously. If we would not measure and not compare and not talk to each other, we would not be as successful as we are now. If we're going to be changing things that we're doing, we want that to have an impact on the patient. It can't just be an esoteric academic impact. Value-based healthcare says that's the goal. If today you've improved outcomes, without escalating any cost, you've succeeded. Today, if you've delivered equally good outcomes more efficiently, you've succeeded. Today, if you didn't do one of those two things, you failed today. By some funny reason, I always want to be a doctor. It was just a feeling that that was the right place for me. In Germany, it's not allowed to found a clinic. It's not a tradition to have a specialized clinic on one disease. That is only one of the difficulties. But I was sure that a specialized clinic is good. I was sure that a faculty system is good and outcome is good. That I that are the elements I was very sure about. In those days, Hulang already had the profile in Germany being one of the prostate cancer specialists. And we were running an outpatient clinic, especially for prostate cancer patients. And I was asked whether I would like to, to join that outpatient clinic. And I thought, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, yeah, that was 1995. I was very lucky to convince eight of my former uh, Oper Arts, you would, would call them associate professors, to come to this clinic and stay here forever. Because if you are combined to a clinic for a lifelong, you act a little bit different uh, than if you stay there only for four or six years. So you want your clinic to be good. Usually you, you kind of use your position in a hospital to make your personal career. If you know that you stay in a hospital for, let's say, five years, seven years, and then you go away, the motivation of, of starting long-term projects, studies for example, that need 10 years to bring you results, is not very high. All the leading surgeons are equally ranked, are equally paid, and every decision is made in consensus of all these 10 leading uh, surgeons. The faculty system has many, many advantages. In this very, very small field of prostate cancer, each of us has specialized in a subspecialization. So one is very interested in genome analysis, the other in the development of new imaging systems. And there are many, many new drugs coming up for advanced disease, and one is an internationally recognized expert in this. So when I come every morning here to the Martini Clinic, I meet at 7 o'clock 10 international experts, and this is fantastic. This is uh, intellectual stimulation, and this is fun. <laughs> the mission of the Martini Clinic is to improve prostate cancer treatment. We want to have the optimal treatment for each patient. Well, in Germany, the average rate of, of prostatectomies per year is below 50 for the whole the hospital. I perform usually two radical prostatectomies per day, so I perform over 300 procedures per year. When we started, uh, we did about 200 cases a year, which was a lot at that time. And now we're doing 2,200. We are by far the biggest now in the world. 
Every half year, our surgeons compare each other in terms of the quality they have achieved in their patients, outcome qualities. And this is a, a certain culture which you won't find anywhere else. Outcome measurement is, is for me the basis for, for improvement. You cannot improve if you don't know the results. It's not just an obligation, it's, 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 it's fun, it's thrilling to know the results as a basis and to see how you improve. We would be absolutely stupid if we would not do that. It's, it's, it's a part of our, of our profession. In the Martini Clinic, we collect positive margin rates, nerve sparing rates, continency rates, and patient-reported outcome measures. We start with the first questionnaire seven days after surgery, then half a year after surgery, and then every year when the surgery is over. We have patients who receive it for 20 years now. It's not only important to get your outcome data. They have to be taken by standardized criteria so that you can compare these results uh, in Hamburg, in Munich, in Berlin, in Copenhagen, in New York, or wherever. So you need standardization of uh, the outcome evaluation. In Germany, in 2012, there were 25,000 patients treated for a radical prostatectomy. Only 32.8% were treated with a nerve-sparing procedure. That's very low. A third. In the Martini Clinic, the rate of nerve sparing is 88%. We can leave the nerve at least at one side inside the body. So the functional outcome for the patient and the quality of life is much bigger here. As soon as the prostate is taken out on the table and we have done the nerve sparing, we give this prostate to the pathologist under the microscope with a special extensive frozen section workup of the prostate, he can tell me if the cancer has attached the nerve site. And the frozen section is so important that we said we, we must find a way to harbor the specimen and then we make color on the, on the capsule of the prostate, send it to frozen section and they give us in 30 to 45 minutes a clear result whether we can take the nerves away, that's very important for patients, they might lose their potency, but we only take it away when there is cancer. And that is a very, very important step during the procedure. 98% of our patients would recommend this clinic after they have been treated here to their friends uh, or, or relatives. And I'm also proud about that. <laughs> this is a very, very unusual figure. The thing I like most is to be in the operating room. I like to be there, I like to see a problem. We know that there's a problem, we have proven it. We have the possibilities to get rid of the problem. That's a very practical standpoint, but it's very satisfying. We believe that outcomes are the true measure of quality. How well did the patient actually do in a holistic sense in terms of their medical problems relative to how much did it cost us to deliver those outcomes? And that has not been the definition of success and failure in healthcare organizations. Once you sort of realign and start to understand, well, actually, value is the central goal of any healthcare organization and any healthcare provider, uh, then you have to ask yourself whether all the other dimensions of how we go about uh, delivering healthcare actually are aligned. To me, value based healthcare is much, much about moving away from standardizing processes into deciding what are the most important outcomes that we can measure per medical condition for the patient. You decide the best way to give that outcome and you look into your own processes and see how can I and how can we in our organization work in order to improve the outcomes. Our perspective is that we've tried incremental fixes and each of those incremental improvements might have had a minor impact, but they haven't addressed the fundamental problems in the structure of the system. Value-based healthcare is a redesign of the system as a whole, with value at its center and measurement of value as a, as a kind of oil that can grease the engine of competition and improvement. One of the exciting aspects of value-based healthcare is that you define success as the end result, or quality as the end result, and that's why it becomes extremely powerful for those who have implemented it, such as the Martini Clinic in, in Hamburg. For me, the strength of the Martini Clinic is they're always coming back to, have we gotten better outcomes for our patients? Can we do this more efficiently? And it's just 
the nature of things that as they've gotten better, more people have wanted to be treated there. And now they're the biggest prostate cancer center by volume in the world. I think you're gonna see a new generation of clinical leaders who approach this very differently. I think we're gonna see hopefully more Dr. Hulans who, who, who understand that being a department chief is great at some theoretical level and it's very prestigious, but ultimately, what more legacy, what more prestigious thing that could you possibly do in life than lead a team that produces spectacular innovation and value in care? I mean, for a major disease that afflicts human beings. Uh, what, what a legacy that is that Dr. Hoogland has created. At Boston Children's Hospital in the Department of Plastic and Oral Surgery, we have nine full-time surgeons. It's the largest pediatric plastic and oral surgery department in the world. And we do a broad range of things, from hand surgery to cleft and craniofacial and vascular anomalies. So it's a, it's a very broad-ranging specialty and department. Can I take a look in there? Right. For my particular specialty, I have patients with a very specific anatomic issue that they need help with, and in one or two or three or four hours, it, you fix that problem and you can have an impact on them for the rest of their lives. So that's really rewarding for me, and it's also, you know, you can, you can see what that does for families and how grateful they are. In the past, we've had a system that reimbursed based on quantity of product, and there was no mechanism to analyze the patient experience, and, and there really wasn't even a mechanism to analyze the outcomes. So outcomes are critical because you make decisions and you change practice based on outcomes. Now, outcomes that matter to patients are more important, and, and I think that's obvious because if we're gonna be changing things that we're doing, we want that to have an impact on the patient. The really complex patients, the complex craniofacial patients in, in my practice, for example, you take care of these patients for weeks or months, and there are often dozens of different clinicians involved. So getting a better understanding of where the cost drivers are can be critical, and how you might provide better care more uh, effectively, less expensively, I think one of the most exciting things at Boston Children's Hospital is that we have a leadership team uh, that believes in linking quality and safety and outcomes with cost. It's quite a big movement if you look look at the look at the side here. I also need to As a clinician and a researcher, your natural tendency is to try to collect as much data as possible. Yeah. Okay, let's do the other medial orbit. What is holding us? Um, yeah, it's the back of the maxillary sinus and the pterygoids. What I found going through this process is that more information is not necessarily better, that uh, collecting the correct information is what's important, and actually the minimum data set is probably important. Having information that flows in both directions, having information that, that I as a chief can look at in real time and can look at costs in real time and, and overlay that with outcomes metrics in real time. And, and that's where you're going to see improvements. There we go. OK. That helped. The arithmetic differences that we used to chase in cleft, cleft lip repair are usually relatively meaningless to the patient. They want to be able to speak. They want to be able to swallow. They have their own way of analyzing how they look in the mirror, and it's very different from the way we measure it with calipers. It can't just be an esoteric academic impact. We want it to be something that changes the human condition. I think all roads point to outcomes, and that's why in our group here uh, we are so obsessed with outcome measurement. And any children's hospital and a place like Boston Children's, I mean, they're in the crosshairs of everybody trying to reform healthcare. Rather than go in denial and say, oh, look at our reputation, look at our published papers, oh, look at our rankings, we're number one in 92 of 93 things. Instead of that attitude, which a lot of academic medical centers have adopted in this last decade, Boston Children's, I think, and the leaders there, people like John Miro, uh, have said, look, we've got to demonstrate that we actually deliver value. And by the way, we could probably do better. <laughs> They're a wonderful example of uh, value-based healthcare uh, in process. My personal mission is always the patient focus. Whenever I practice as an OBGYN, I always ask myself, 
Would I do this to my sister? Is this what my sister would have wanted? Um, that's, I guess, the patient focus. But I try to make it as close to myself as possible. When I came on board in, in the fall of 2012, the situation in the hospital was uh, stable. But that was not good enough to challenge the future because we will run out of money just like anybody else if we can continue working the way we do. So we needed to take the next step in delivering better value per resource used. The, the large inefficiencies are when the results are poor because then you use resources and don't get any value for it. So we needed to improve our results and the quality of care. And we needed to do that in order to be prepared for what's coming ahead of us. When you think about value-based healthcare, I used to call it the cultural journey. You should change the culture of how you think in healthcare. And this journey decides in the leadership. And then you can go down to create an organization that people actually want to deliver better outcome for the patients. It was a process that we started about two years ago, uh, and uh, we have involved around 9,000 our employees in creating new core values, so to say. And these core values are pretty much based on the strategy that value-based healthcare has. So we let them discuss what is important for them, what is important for the department, and what is important for the customers. And based on those 9,000 people's conversation to each other, we created new core values. The main issue is always, how is this going to benefit our patients? Value-based healthcare is a powerful instrument in, in actually providing live feedback to uh, individual units performing surgery, in our case, total hypotroplasties. Once uh, individual surgeons in this hospital understand that some surgeons are performing better than others, then the major question for every single surgeon will be, what can I do in order to improve my own results? Of course, in a large hospital organization like this, where we have 16,000 staff, this is not done in one week. Uh, and we are still struggling in the beginning of our journey. I can see that we've come such a long way. We can do things that we couldn't dream about just a few years ago. And we want to continue this successful journey. We need to change. We have to change. And we have to change continuously. It's going to be part of the way we work. Um, business as usual is never going to be okay again. You always have to be able to change to improve care. Sorgerska is a, uh, a very large university hospital. It is one of the very largest in, in Europe. It is the result of a three-way merger of three hospitals in Gothenburg, uh, the second largest city in Sweden. Barbara Fredin, who is a clinician by training, came in uh, into an organization where the focus had been, and I think rightly so, much on getting the financials in order. So she could add to that, uh, how can we take this organization to the next step and increase the motivation of dogs, the innovativeness of the team, bring innovation closer to patients and faster to patients. Value-based healthcare, in one sense, can be said to be very simple. But once you really start using it, it actually is a transformative concept, right? It, it changes how we think about organization, remuneration, etc. So, Solgrenska have been very successful, but I would also say it's quite early in the journey. Virtually every healthcare system really lacked a clear goal that was really connected to the patient. We're starting to see amazing things happening in healthcare. So, it's, it's taken a while, but we're starting to move. And when you go to a country like Sweden, you know, that's very much of a socialistic kind of place and you see the stuff they're doing, uh, you know, it's just awesome. Value-based healthcare is very much of freedom to the healthcare professionals. And it will, by then becoming transparent, also become freedom to patients to be able to choose more freely the care that is giving the best result to them. On one hand, more services are not always better. And on the other hand, simple cost reduction is not always better. I think the key is to link your 
cost efforts with your quality efforts. And if we provide that value, we do the right thing, whether we are in a capitalistic system, in a socialistic system, or a government-run, budget-driven system, it's the same. The lesson maybe that, that we have learned that might be transferable to other teams is that you should be open. You should be open to, to the ideas of other people and you should be open of quality measurement. Use data in a positive way because you do it for your patient. And if you're not doing that, patients are now so aware and they deserve the best treatment that they will change the field of medicine anyway. I try to lean back and ask myself if I would be a patient, uh, what would you like to have? And uh, to have outcome data, I'm very, very sure that the number one who will benefit from it will be the patient. You need standards for what to measure. Everybody needs to measure pretty much the same thing, at least at some minimum level. And until we get standards, uh, we're not going to get the real liftoff. That's the secret key. If you can measure those things really well, then you've got the, the, the key critical piece of, 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 of information that you need to do lots of other things. But because it's so connected to what really matters, and I think all clinicians accept what really matters, it's happening.